Isn't it awesome to see all these kids here this morning? Amen. That's awesome. We just need more kids in here, or more people in here. So, uh, by the way, Casper, I have a card for you. <laughs> it's a coupon for a haircut. So, I couldn't resist this thing. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about the fruit of the Spirit, but we're going to look at it a little bit different. The nine-part fruit. It's one fruit with different parts inside it. Uh, and uh, if you turn to Galatians chapter 5, we'll be going through that. I already read it. So uh, the fruit of the Spirit is what we uh, just read about. Um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Can everybody say that you have those things? <laughs> Me neither. I'm working on it. So, like I said, it's one fruit, like an orange, that's why I use this picture, it's one fruit, because if you peel an orange, it's got different slices, different pieces. Think of the fruit of the Spirit as one fruit, you open it, and each slice is a, a different aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. Um, the original Greek word that uh, Paul used in this scripture today uh, is karpos, K-A-R-P-O-S. It means a result of something. When the fruit of the Spirit is displayed in our lives, when people can look at us and say that he's loving, he's joyful, he's peaceful, that means that's showing them that the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives. Amen. That's a result. The fruit of the Spirit is a result of the Holy Spirit leading us. Just like the branches of a grapevine have to be connected to the vine in order to bear, group, bear grapes, the fruit of the Spirit is evidence of being connected to Christ. Jesus said in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Amen. He is the vine, we are the branch. Uh, John 15, 16, uh, in that same message, Jesus said, the fruit will remain. When we're in Christ, when we remain in Christ, that fruit will grow in us, and it will remain in us. So why was the fruit of the Spirit even mentioned? Because of the five verses preceding it. If you look at that, um, it says there's uh, the works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and so on. And our flesh wants things that prevent God's will in our life, that prevent God's Holy Spirit from working in our life and from being in fully, con fully in control of us. If you look at the, verse 17, it says, the, fle the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And the bottom line is, you can be led by the flesh, or you can be led by the Spirit. You can't be led by both Amen. at the same time. They're in constant conflict. I heard a preacher say one time, you can't run with the devil and walk with God at the same time. That's impossible. You can't do that. The best part, okay, if you read uh, verse 23, it says there's no law against them. What does that mean? That means that when we are uh, following the Spirit, you can't be too loving. You can't be too peaceful. You can't be too joyful. You can't be too kind. You can't be you know, too good or faithful or gentle or uh, have too much self-control. Does anybody have too much self-control? No. We need to work on that. We all need to work on that. And so with, as we go through this message, I'm going to expand on each one of these and uh, kind of explain each one. Uh, and show uh, how you can help them to grow within you. Um, so my first point is this, the fruit and the gifts. The fruit and the gifts. So sometimes people get the fruit of the Spirit confused with the gifts of the Spirit, and they're really two different things. 
the fruit of the Spirit is something that grows, like I said, when we are fully committed to Jesus Christ, when we're fully committed to follow him. And the gifts are something that really we're kind of born with, that we, uh, we uh, that grow within us. Um, if you're a Christian, you're to have the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life, or at least developing in your life. If we want to know how we're growing as Christ followers, we shouldn't focus on how gifted we are or how to use our gifts, because the closer we get to God, the more he's going to reveal to us how to use the gifts that he's given us. Not that our gifts aren't important, because they are. They're very important. It's just that we can't operate in our gifts while at the same time gratifying the flesh because they work, like I said, in opposition to each other. That's what verse 17 tells us. If you're taking notes, write this down. The fruit of the Spirit in your life is proof of a life that has been transformed by the power of God. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit in your life is proof of a life that has been transformed by the power of God. Of God because you can't make that transformation on your own right. you can't just decide to be more Christian or be more uh, loving or joyful or have peace and all that it has to be something that comes from the, the Spirit of God being led by the Holy Spirit now it's not uncommon to see uh, men and women operate in their spiritual gifts and then turn around and do something sinful you see something someone that's uh, a great Christian singer, a great Christian artist, but at the same time they are living with their boyfriend or girlfriend or living an immoral lifestyle in some way or another. Uh, God uses whoever he wants, whenever he wants, and however he wants. Have you ever been talking to somebody that's not a Christian and they say something that just like sparks in your, and you, you just think, you know, that might have come from God. Have you ever had that happen to you? Somebody that's not a Christian can say something that will really uh, turn a light on. I used to know a preacher years ago. He was from Texas. And he used to have a saying that I loved. He'd say, God can use crooked sticks to make straight licks. He can make straight licks with crooked sticks is what he said. Straight licks with crooked sticks. What it means is he can take somebody that's not exactly living a Christian lifestyle and use them for his purposes. Yeah. That's what that means. But the opposite is also true. Uh, there are people all over the world who continually show the fruit of the Spirit in their daily lives. They might be serving behind the scenes, uh, visiting in the hospital, uh, offering their time by just, just being with somebody in need. So we see both sides of that. People that... Uh, operate in the church and do good things in the church, but they're uh, not living a moral lifestyle. But then we see people that live a moral lifestyle and at the same time operate in the church. They have that fruit of the Spirit in every part of their life. The gifts receive far more attention uh, than the fruit of the Spirit. Like right now, you're seeing me use my gift. It's public speaking, talking to people and uh, singing in front of people. That's a gift. But we have gifts, the fruit of the Spirit, that are, you know, we show our love, our joy, our peace, our faithfulness, our gentleness, and all that. So the fruit may not be shouting for attention, but we can always know that when the fruit is present in our lives and when it's not. We can see that in other people, too, when the fruit of the Spirit, when somebody's not loving, when somebody's not peaceful or joyful. So I want to go on and talk about the gifts. So let's talk about love, joy, and peace right now. Love, joy, and peace. Love. The first thing I want to say about Christian love, the fruit of the Spirit, bless you, bless you. I feel special saying that since I'm a preacher. Bless you, my child. But uh, I feel uh, like... Fruit of the Spirit. Love is mentioned first because it's the most important. Right. Love. Without love, you don't have anything else. Right. But love, uh, 
people think of love as a feeling, but when it comes to Christian love, it's not a feeling. It's not a feeling at all. It's an action. It's what we do. Love, it's, a, it's an active display that compels us to put others' needs above our own. Love honors others and celebrates truth. Notice that. Celebrates truth, no matter how difficult it is to hear that truth. And we live in a society today that doesn't want to hear truth. They want to hear what they want to hear. They want to have their ears tickled. They want to hear that it's okay to live with your boyfriend or girlfriend. It's okay to be a homosexual. It's okay to lie. It's okay to be in other religions and worship other gods and things like that. They want to hear that. But the truth is the opposite of those things. And that's how we show love to them by telling them that truth. The gospel truth, the truth of the Bible. Amen. And that's what the world doesn't want to hear. God's love seen in us will make hatred, apathy, and self-preservation, pridefulness far from us. That's some things that we don't even want to have anything to do with when we have God's love. Now let's talk about joy. And this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Joy. Joy is something that should absolutely, without a doubt, be seen in the church. When somebody that's never been in this church before walks through those doors, they should feel joy and love that they can't feel anywhere outside those doors. A Christian should be the most joyful people in the world. Agreed? Amen. Amen. Okay, I don't want to get my lost thing out here. There you go. Uh, so... Uh, we should be the most joyful people in the world. Why? Because this book, God's Word, the absolute truth, tells us that in the end, we have victory in Jesus. Amen. And you can't get that outside the, you know, in the world. You can't get that. So we should be the most joyful people in the world. And this doesn't mean that we're always in a good mood. What it means is that in all circumstances, all situations, we should be able to show that joy in anything, anything that happens. We could be, you know, that could be death of a family member. We still have that deep joy. It's not something that's on the surface of this ruled by our circumstances. It's something that's deep within, that we know, we know, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. All things. Joyful people don't allow misery, sorrow, sadness, or despair to rule their thoughts or guide their actions. So we should be joyful. Peace. This is something that I talked about last week. Peace. How to have God's peace in your life. The, uh, God's peace is a deep well of confidence that God, we know God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. We should be able to stand on that promise. God will do what he says he will do. C.S. Lewis says, Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. I like that. Let me repeat that if you want to write it down. Life with God is not immunity from difficulties, but peace in difficulties. Peace comes from standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises. Standing on Christ our rock. The solid ground. Peace is incomprehensible to the world. The peace that we get from God. So let's move on because I talked about peace last week. I don't want to be redundant. Patience, kindness, and goodness. Let's talk about those. Patience. Patience. Patience is waiting without complaining. Can you do that? That's difficult, isn't it? Irma Bombeck said, At my age, patience is not a virtue, it's a luxury. <laughs> patience is like that one friend who remains cool as a cucumber while everyone else is losing their marbles. It's a superhero power that allows you to wait in the longest grocery line without frustration. As you, you ever in one of those lines at Walmart where the, the cashier looks like she just took a handful of Valium or something? She just moved so slow. 
patience. That's what we need. In a world where everyone is racing to the finish line, patience allows us to just stroll along, stop and smell the roses, and at the same time, still get to your destination on time. That's patience. Patience is produced when we support the growth in others as they're on their own journey. That's what we need to be doing to disciple others. We're growing, and when we help others, I've seen this in my own life, when we help others, when we guide them in their spiritual walk, that helps us to grow. That's the way we should see it. Rather than seeing somebody in need and saying, you know, I don't have time. You do have time. You do have time. Patience allows for you to help that other person while at the same time you will be growing. That's, you'll be growing the uh, fruit of the Spirit. Believers are commanded to emulate the Lord's patience. We're to have the patience like God. Psalm 86, 15 says, God is slow to anger. Are you slow to anger? Are you that way? Or are you one of those people who just fly off the handle at any minute? Believers are commanded to emulate the Lord's patience. Colossians 3.12 says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, that's us, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So now let's talk about kindness. We see these things uh, on social media and stuff that says uh, random acts of kindness. Those are good to do. You can do that. Kindness is being genuinely, genuinely kind to anyone and everyone. Everyone needs to be needs to see kindness. Everybody, especially from us, followers of Jesus Christ. Kindness helps others and serves others when those others are in need. When we show kind of kindness to others, it'll come back to you. It will come back to you in one way or another. I've seen this over and over too. Uh, kindness, you can see it as, as a, like a boomerang, a boomerang, a boomerang. See kindness as a boomerang. It always comes back to you and sometimes with a tree. It looks out for well-being of others and shows compassion when needed. It assists others and shows courtesy and benevolence to others. Be kind to one another. We're to be kind, to be kind just as the Lord is kind. And uh, for 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone. Must not be quarrelsome. So let's go on to goodness. Goodness, what does that mean? It's truly desiring to help others. Do you have that desire to help others when you see others in need, see somebody that needs some, some help? And I've seen that even recently right here in this church, and that's just, I'm just so, so grateful for that, that someone in, in need and we reach out to them, and that is just a wonderful thing. Uh, goodness does the right thing and challenges other people to do the right thing, even if uh, the conversation is uncomfortable. It doesn't. It is. It is decent, honest, moral, honorable, virtuous, and full of integrity. Good people don't just do the right thing; they make things right. Make a note of that. Good people don't just do good things, do the right things, they make things right. We make things right. That's what God calls us to do in goodness, that part of the fruit of the Spirit. So now let's talk about faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Faithfulness is keeping your word. And I was thinking about this, faithfulness. Remember years ago when we didn't need to have contracts and lawyers and things like that? When you made an agreement with somebody, you'd shake their hand, and that is your contract. A man is only as good as their word. Faithfulness, this part of the fruit of the Spirit, causes us to keep our word. When we say, I'll pay you back, you pay them back. 
When you say, I'll come over this afternoon and help you, you come over this afternoon and help them. When you say you're going to do something in the church, you do something in the church. That's faithfulness. That's what the Spirit leads us to do. Faithfulness possesses a constancy and a consistency, devotedness, fidelity, steadfast in all interactions. It's being reliable in a world that isn't. And you can see that today, right? The world is not faithful. The world is not reliable. Faithful people are not disloyal or flippant with their commitments. We make a commitment, and that is solid. That's set in concrete. We do that. Now let's talk about gentleness, or your King James Version will say meekness. Now, uh, you've probably heard it before that meekness sometimes is confused with weakness. And that could not be further from the truth. Because our Lord Jesus Christ was meek. Was he weak? No, absolutely not. It's gentleness. It's strength under control. Meekness is strength under control. And meekness or gentleness is allowing God to deal with others so that we don't have to take matters into our own hands. Revenge. Vengefulness. We let God take care of it. And I can tell you from my own experience, when something happens, do not take revenge for yourself. Let God take care of it. He can handle it so much better. Right, Jeff? Yes, sir. Yep. That is, I see that in my life over and over and over. Let God take care of it. Just be gentle. We are call, called to be gentle and be meek and have our strength under control. Because who is stronger than someone who has God behind them like we do? Nobody. Nobody. Being gentle doesn't mean weak. Remember that. Remember that. Gentle people are not harsh. We're not calloused. We're not mean. We're gentle. We reflect Jesus in all we do. And now, last but not least, self-control. How many of you need to work on that? Yeah. Those, you guys, right off the bat. <laughs> we need to work on self-control. <laughs> self-control is being able to keep yourself in check. It's a superhero power that lets you walk through Walmart and go through the checkout line without grabbing your favorite candy bar off the impulse buy rack. Self-control. It's not letting your circumstances cause you to lose control. Self-control exhibits moderation, temperance, discipline. <coughs> it's choosing uh, under pressure to chase after the important, what's more important rather than what's urgent. Self-control people show restraint and are not impulsive. Andy Mineo, here's another quote that I really like this, I love this. He said, here is the paradox of Christian living. We give up control of self to gain self-control. You get that? We give up control of self to gain self-control. We give up control of ourself so that we can follow Jesus and let him control us. And once we do that, we'll gain the self-control that's a fruit of the Spirit. So do any of these uh, convict you or challenge you in any way? Can you say, yes, I have that, yes, I have that, I need to work on that? If you need to work on that, which I guarantee everybody in this room has to, and everybody watching the video, hi people, need to work on the fruit of the Spirit, the non-part fruit. We all need to work on those. So finally, my last point is uh, life by the Spirit. Life by the Spirit. Letting the Holy Spirit guide us doesn't allow for us to be prideful, to be impatient, to be hateful, to be rude. That only happens when we're led by the flesh. When we let the flesh rule us. The nine-part fruit is a byproduct of a life surrendered 
to the Spirit of God. And that is the key. When we surrender to God, when we make that commitment to God, we will see the development of this nine-part fruit of the Spirit. So many times we don't see growth in ourselves and actually say things like that, like, you know, I'm, I'm an impatient person, or I just can't get along with certain people. You ever say that? There's certain people that you just can't get along with. The truth of the matter is that when we have the mindset of following Jesus, we're just choosing, or of not following Jesus, we're just choosing to follow the, the, the flesh. We're following the flesh. When we follow the flesh, these things won't be evident in our life, the nine-part fruit of the Spirit. Seeking God and asking Him to help us grow this fruit of the Spirit is a huge challenge to our nature because we're choosing to deny the flesh. And by nature, we are not spiritual beings. We want to be prideful. I mean, if you uh, ever doubt that, look at a little kid, a little uh, two, three, four-year-old. It's all about me. What's one of the first words a kid learns? Mine! Me! I want that. It's all about me. That's our nature. We have to learn to follow the Lord and develop these fruit of the Spirit. We should use... Um, if we keep our focus on God, he will put us in situations that allow the Holy Spirit to develop this fruit within us. He will put us in these situations that will help us to grow. And we should use our spiritual eyes, and this is an important point, we should use our spiritual eyes to see every problem as a character building opportunity. We should use our spiritual eyes to see every problem, every situation, every circumstance that comes along as a character building opportunity. Withholding from our flesh is very important. We should be taking that very seriously. Don't give in to every whim that you want every craving that you have. Why? Because our flesh wants to get even. But the Spirit calls us to love and show kindness. Our flesh wants to entertain every sinful thought that comes along. But the Spirit calls us to walk in self-control. Our flesh wants to dictate, dictate our lives with the ups and downs of our mood swings, our fluctuating moods, but the Spirit calls us to walk in joy and peace. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. We should put on Jesus Christ every day. Put on the armor of God. Put on Jesus Christ. Walk in love. Walk in gentleness. Walk in peace as God calls us to. And that's not what the flesh wants. We should follow what the Spirit wants to do. As we give the Spirit more control in our lives, He begins to do in us and through us what only He can do. And what is that? To shape us and to grow us into being Christ-like. And that should be our ultimate goal, to be Christ-like, to be more like Christ every day. We're literally being transformed when we do that, when we follow Jesus Christ. So here's my challenge, and this might seem a little off base at first, but listen. Think of something you have felt the Lord leading you to do. And the Lord is leading each and every one of you to do something. Think of something the Lord is leading you to do. What's keeping you from following his lead? Chances are, it's a desire of the flesh. Well, I can't do that because of such and such and such. And I don't want to do that because of such and such and such. Follow him. Do what he wants you to do. Follow him in every aspect 
of your uh, Christian walk. Ask him to show you where you need to grow in your spiritual life. It's possible that you need his guidance in one or more aspects of the non-part fruit. We all do. I can think of areas of the non-part fruit that I need guidance in. Can you? I'm sure you can. We can all think of somewhere that we need guidance. Let's uh, go ahead and stand for the invitation. Um, if you just want to come up here and pray, you can do that. If you feel the Lord leading you to, to follow him in some way and uh, use your gift that he's given you, um, come up here and let's talk about it. And let's do that. Let's get that out <clears throat> next week invite a friend bring somebody with you it's about time to have bring a friend bring a friend day isn't it we did that last year and we had a good service page 106 okay 106 <laughs>